Well, hey there, and happy New Year, Cornerstone Church. Heart and Soul is part of our women's ministry designed to connect older women and younger women in mentoring relationships as described in Titus 2. Well, starting January 6th, we're going to offer morning and evening opportunities of Heart and Soul. So make plans to join us for our Living Life Together series. Next Sunday, we begin a new series of Life Apps electives. The new classes will be for men only, for women only, how to study the Bible, and a LifeWay Bible survey class. Visit our website for more information and make plans to plug into a Life Apps class starting January 8th. Open House for Cornerstone Kids and Fusion Student Ministry is January the 20th at 7 p.m. Come out and see our newly renovated facility, hear about our vision for 2017 for children and student ministries, and fellowship over dessert. We're excited to walk alongside you in the parenting journey. If you've been visiting with us and want to know how to become a part of all that God's doing in and through Cornerstone Church Bluffton, we encourage you to sign up for our next membership class. It's going to start January 22nd and run three consecutive Sundays at 5 p.m. Sign up on the connection card or on the website at cornerstonebluffton.org. Like us on Facebook at Cornerstone Church Bluffton. Follow us on Twitter at CC Bluffton and Instagram at Cornerstone Bluffton. Check out our website, cornerstonebluffton.org for details about everything you've heard today. That's what's going on at Cornerstone Church. Well, welcome to 2017. Let's see a show of hands of those who have already set some goals for this year, some resolutions. Anybody? Oh my, not many. Really? One, two, I can almost count on one hand. All right. We've got a couple. That's okay. That's all right. Nothing wrong with that. I, I admit I don't, I'm not one of those goal setters or resolution setters either, uh, that, but that's because I, I do tend to have in the back of my mind... Uh, where I'm headed and the things I want to do. And as I thought about that over the last week or two, uh, one of the things that I thought about was that, in a sense, Jesus really kind of gave us some of the resolutions we should have. Now, I'm getting some feedback. If you can, I don't know if it's coming through up here. Uh, but anyway, Jesus gave us some, uh, some ideas of the types of things we should, we should have resolutions about. And two of them, in particular, someone even asked him, they said, Jesus, what are, of all the commandments, what are the two most important commandments we should focus on? And Jesus, of course, said, love God and love people. And so today I'd like to focus on that second one, loving people, choosing to love people. It's more specifically, choosing to love people who are difficult to love. Because all of us can love people who are easy to love. I mean, those people who are bubbly and uh, you know, just fun to be around. There's no problem loving those, but it's the people that are a little more difficult are the ones that we really have to focus in on. And so I'd like to look at that today. Now, in thinking about that, one of the things that's kind of amazing is we have two kinds of beliefs. All of us have two kinds of beliefs. First, we have our intellectual belief, and that's the kind of belief that we say that we believe, those things that we think that we believe, those things that we teach, whether it be here on Sunday morning in a sermon or in a life app or in a small group, maybe a men's group, a women's group, our intellectual beliefs are those things that we advise our children about. So maybe if your child came home and they said, Mommy, so-and-so stole my lunch money and you know I, I'm going to get them back by doing so-and-so, we'd say, No, you know, let's not do that because Jesus tells, tells us to to love and to uh, not to retaliate. And those are intellectual beliefs. Now, uh, we can also sometimes argue about these intellectual beliefs. So we have intellectual beliefs on the one hand, but then on the other hand, we have what I would call actual beliefs. And sometimes those are completely different from each other because actual beliefs are, are those things that, that are really the basis of our decision. They dictate our actions, they drive our behaviors, and they determine our course in life. Now, these are, like I said, sometimes very different from each other. So let me give you an example. I've got a verse here. Uh, bring up, there it is right there, Matthew 5, 44. And it says this, Jesus speaking here, Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who, per who persecute you. Love your enemies. Now, our intellectual beliefs are those, again, that we think we believe, we say we believe, that we teach, that we, we, that we advise, and we even argue for. And so this is the kind of thing that we would teach in a life app. 
or that I would preach on Sunday morning or that you would teach in a men's uh, small group or a women's small group or something like that. And, and those are, they would be things that we would actually argue for. So, for example, let's say that I said, well, really, Jesus isn't saying to love your enemies. He's more talking figuratively there. And really, we could hate our enemies. If I began to preach that, some of you would probably pull out your phone and start texting Pastor Mark and saying, do you know what this guy is preaching? You have, he's preaching that we can, you know, we can hate our enemies. And some of you might excuse yourself and go out there in the lobby and, and even call him and say, what do you want us to do about this? He's preaching you know, the wrong thing. And some of you, if, if it got too bad, would rightly possibly stand up and say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, are you saying, and begin to argue right here, not letting me kind of continue with that wrong sermon. And our intellectual beliefs do that. Now, in my experience, even though that's our intellectual beliefs, and we all believe that, in my experience, our actual beliefs of probably most of us, or maybe I'll just say many, are opposite of that. Now, in my experience, when someone is mean, ugly, nasty, vulgar, and just a big bully, most people don't tend to love that kind of person. Instead, they go like this with their arm, they walk away from them, and they say, I am not going to have a relationship with that person. Do you know how vulgar he is, how ugly he is? how nasty he is or she is and we have we have no interest in pursuing any kind of relationship that's just my experience you you know you might be very different which would be great but that's my experience so this is how this would look in say a small group so let's say you decide i, I want to join a small group you know maybe you're a couple we, we want to join a small group so you go to the small group and it's the first time you're there and you're you're getting to know this lady and, you know, in the conversation, she says, so where did you go to college? And you say, oh, I went to so-and-so state university. <laughs> Are you serious? You went there? Who goes there? I mean, could you even find a job when you got done? I mean, did, maybe is that the only place you got accepted to? Uh, honey, honey, come here. Listen to this. Tell me where you went to school. Now, if that happened to you in a small group, who would go back? You know, and if you did go back, would you sit next to them? Would you say, hey, why don't we get together for coffee this week? Would you like to come over for dinner this week? No. We don't do that, right? No. That person is going to be held off at arm's distance. Or we just may not go back at all. Because our actual beliefs are often different than our intellectual beliefs. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well... You know, when Jesus says to love your enemies, I don't, I mean, he's not saying to love them like you would a friend or a family member. I think what, and we begin to kind of, you know, backstep a little bit and and maybe justify our actions. And we think, well, you know, what did he really mean by love? I mean, what, you know, what, what does that really mean? If you look at 1 Corinthians, love is an action, you know. Love is patient. I'm being patient with them. Love is kind. Well, I'll be kind, you know, and and we kind of go through that list and we think, well, you know, that's love. You know, I don't have to be buddy-buddy. And, 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 you know, I could kind of see that maybe because that's a little little vague. You know, it's not real specific. So the big question is, if we're going to make this a part of our life, this being the second greatest command of all Scripture, the question is, what did Jesus mean? What does he mean, love your enemy? And that's what I like to look at this morning. Because he does define this in other places a little more clearly. So let's take a look at that. So if you look over in uh, John 13.34, which is going to be our main passage for today, Jesus tells us to love, and then he clarifies that, as he loved us. So let me read the verse. Jesus is talking to his, his disciples. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Now, that's still kind of vague. What do you mean, love one another? I mean, how do you, you know, I mean, that's kind of like the last one, love your enemies, love one another. Well, I, I can, you know, I'm loving, you know, I'm doing this, that. I, I, that's loving, right? But then J- Jesus clarifies what he means. He says, as I have loved you, 
love one another. See, now that's a little bit more difficult. And you think, well, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean, as I have loved you? Well, we, we can kind of get a little clarification on that. Because Jesus, we see several examples in Scripture of, of that. And it would be great, it would be wonderful if we could call the disciples up here and say, you know, what exactly did Jesus mean when he said, as I have loved you? I mean, what did he do? You know, could you, could you explain that to me? You know, could you share that with us so that we, we have a better picture of what he, Jesus was talking about? And so what we're going to do this morning is, if you can all put on your imagination cap, we're going to have a conversation with the disciples. And we're going to see what they might say using Scripture and our imagination. We're going to see how would they possibly answer that. As I have loved you, Jesus said, so love one another. So we're going to ask the disciples, how did Jesus love you? What, what did he mean by that? So if we use our imagination, it might go something like that. So, disciples, how did Jesus love you? What, what did he mean by that? And, of course, you know, Philip might ra raise his hand and say, Well, I, I've got an example. Uh, my brother, you know, Nath Nathaniel, and, and Nathaniel's like, Wait, 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 what? what? Why are you going to start with me? He said, Well, we've got to start with someone. And you've got a really good example of how Jesus loved those who insulted him. And, and Nate's like, insult him what do you mean how I insulted him Phil's like, yeah you did don't you remember you remember when I first met Jesus I, I was out there and, and 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 I heard about this guy and I finally found him and he's out here and he's teaching things that I had never heard before remember and and, and he was doing miracles it was amazing the things he was doing I mean there was a guy he had broken his toe and and he just put his hand in it and it healed and and another guy I, I, I mean he just did thing after thing and all of a sudden it occurred to me that this is the guy that Moses wrote about in the law and the things that the prophets had been prophesied about the Messiah and I was convinced that this was the Messiah so you remember remember I ran home and I told you Nate I said I said I think we found the one that Moses wrote about and the ones that the prophets prophesied about. And do you remember what you said? You said, Nazareth. I said, it's Jesus from Nazareth. You remember? And, and you said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And Nate's like, yeah, but Jesus didn't hear me say that. And Philip goes, I, I think he did. Because you remember, I took you to him and the first thing, when you were walking up to Jesus, when you were walking up, he said, here comes a true Israelite in, in whom there is nothing wrong. Remember? He gave you this huge compliment. And you said, how do you know me? And you remember what he said? He said, I saw you while you were under a fig tree. Now, how he did that, I don't know, Nate. It, it was incredible. But he saw you. And do you think that he just was watching before I came up? No, no, no. I think he saw the whole conversation. I think that he saw that when I told you we found Jesus of Nazareth and you said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I think he saw that. And, you know, I can only imagine how that made him feel. I, you know, I mean, have you ever had someone laugh at the college you went to? You know, or, or maybe say ugly things. Maybe a neighbor says ugly things about you to other people. Or, or maybe an in-law says ugly things about you to your husband or your wife. Or, or maybe someone at work says things or is gossiping. They're insulting you. Now, the question is, how do you respond when people do that? Do you put an arm up and say, I'm not going to get to know that person? They're ugly. They're mean. They're, they're a gossip. They're nasty. And, and, and you, you just sit over here because they're over there. Or maybe they're, you walk and you see them there and you go over there. Or maybe you choose a different small group or like that. Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't do that. You remember what he did, Nate? He loved you. He accepted you. He didn't belittle you. He didn't say something ugly back. He didn't avoid you. He asked you to be a disciple. He said, follow me, Nate. It was amazing. And about that time, 
uh, Matthew kind of heard what was going on, and, and Matthew's kind of standing over here, and, and, and they kind of finish up, and Matthew raises his hand and says, you know, I, I'd like to share, I'd like to share something, because, <clears throat> I, you know, I'm kind of an example of how Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, how Jesus chose really to love the worst of all sinners. I mean, I, I, now, you know, you guys may not know about tax collectors, but I'm a, I'm a Jewish man, and I, I grew up in, you know, a Jewish neighborhood, and, and I had Jewish friends, and, and, you know, of course, my parents were Jewish, and their p- friends were Jewish, and my friends were Jewish, and people I worked for, you know, grew up were Jewish, and, and my, my cousins, and everybody I knew, everybody I grew up with, they were all Jewish, and, and we were all friends. It was, it was our nation. It was everything. But I remember, you know, growing up that I really wanted more than what my parents had. I, I, I really wanted the big house and, you know, a little better, you know, clothes and my shoes. You know, sometimes they had holes and they were needed repair. And I just couldn't stand that. And, and I really wanted more. And there was one way to get more. And, and it was to, well, to become a tax collector. And I know you, you know, you guys probably have tax collectors, but it's not the same as what we were back then. Because as a tax collector back then, I, I had to basically disown my people. And I sided with, with Rome. I sided with them and, and began to tax my people. And the real way that you make money as a tax collector is you steal from your people. And, you know, I knew all the, my neighbors and I knew all the people. I knew what they made and how much they had. And, and I didn't want to tax them to the point where they wouldn't have anything left over and they go bankrupt because I want to be able to tax them next week. So I would tax them from what Rome required and then I would tax them more so that I could, well, keep it for myself. And, you know, people hated me. <clears throat> and I understand why. I was stealing from them. I cheated them. These are people I grew up with. These are my countrymen. And I was, of course, thrown out of my neighborhood. And of course, I was getting a new house anyway. And they're now the synagogue. And, you know, I, everybody hated me. No one, I, the only friends I had were other tax collectors and other sinners, as you might call it, people that were rejected as well. And I, I, I enjoyed it for a while. But I, I have to say, after a while, the, the money just it wasn't worth it. But it was kind of too late for me because I had already chosen that path and and there was such hatred and animosity toward me that it didn't matter what I changed, you know. I was a tax collector. You know, there was actually categories for us. You had, and you'll see it in your Bibles if you read. I I know you guys have have got a lot of these stories already in there, but, but if you read your Bibles, you'll see over and over it says, Sinners and Tax Collectors. Because we weren't even grouped in the same category as sinners. We were like beneath it. We were the bottom of the barrel. Now, you know, to kind of put this in in maybe your own modern way of thinking, you know, there's probably sins that that, that people in your community commit. And, you know, you've got your thieves and, you know, the people, the tax evaders and all that. But then you probably have a, a different group of people that are in categories that maybe maybe they do things to elderly people and, and, and they're worse than just your common thieves. Or maybe they abuse children or men who, who beat up or something on women. You know, those are kind of special category sinners. And, and that was me. That was me. I, I was like at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, I was hated by people, and rightly so. I stole from my friends. I stole from my own family, not my mom and dad, but people, you know, cousins, and because I wanted money. It, 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 anyway, so here's what happened. So I was, you know, one day sitting in my tax booth, stealing from people again, and off in the distance, I saw a group of people, and I'd, I'd heard about this this Jesus guy, and and, and I thought, I wonder that's him 
And he started, they started, this group started walking a little bit closer. And I knew it was him. I heard other people kind of going out there and they were saying, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. I thought, this is going to be cool. Maybe I'll see a miracle. Maybe I'll see something spectacular happen. And he was coming closer. So I was like, boy, I'm going to get a front row seat. This is exciting. And he was coming closer and closer. And all of a sudden, I, I realized he's on the path that leads right to my booth. And I was like, okay, now this is not good. You know, what am I going to tax him? I can't tax Jesus. So maybe I'll pack everything up and act like I'm taking a lunch break or something. But, but he's too close. You know, I can't get all this here before he gets here. And I, I, I was trying to figure out what to do. I didn't know what to do. I can't not tax him and tax everybody else. <clears throat> so I thought, well, maybe I'll just act like I'm doing something. So, you know, he's like, he's like right there. And so I start acting like I'm counting money or something. And I'm looking down and I'm counting. And I can hear them getting closer. I can hear the footsteps of the crowd because you've got a crowd behind them. And they're getting closer and they're right there. So I'm just busily acting like I'm, you know, doing something. And they stop. They stop right in front of me. And I'm just like, oh, God. I don't ever talk to God, but I did then. Oh, God. What are they going to do to me? You know, are they going to stone me? What is this guy? And I could hear people coming. I could hear more people coming up. And and there was just like this dead silence. And and I kind of looked up a little bit, and I could see feet all around me. And I could kind of see feet gathering all around me. And so I thought, I've got to do something. More people are coming. So I kind of raised my head up a little this way and looked out, and I could see people coming, gathering, and they were not happy. They, they just scoured at me, just evil looking at me. And rightly so, I understood. And, it, you know, some of them had fists, and, and, and it looked like some of them had stones. I, I, I couldn't really see, and I looked out this way, and same thing, people gathering. I said, there's a mob for me. I have got to do something quick. And so I, I hadn't looked at Jesus yet. He was right in front of me, and I just took my last breath. And I swallowed, and I, I looked up to see what was going to happen. And I kind of braced myself. I didn't know if he had a big cane, if he had rocks, he was going to start the stoning. And I looked up. He was smiling at me. Smiling. I thought, what a loon. What a loon. I mean, you know, every, here's all these faces of, of people angry. And he's smiling. I thought, maybe he doesn't even realize who I am. But everybody knows who the tax collectors are. Or maybe he knows what he's getting ready to do, and he's getting ready to club me or, or start stoning me, and he's just enjoying the moment. You know, I didn't know. It was just weird, this smile. But then he said, Matthew, follow me. Follow me. I want to go to your house tonight and have dinner. It was weird, but it was my way out. I, for years, I had been looking for a way out, and there was no way out of this life. And he was giving me a way out. And I left everything right there. I didn't care, and I jumped up, and, and the disciples, their mouths were dropped wide open. They were looking at him like, are you a nut? What? But they went along. And we went together, and we went to my house, and we ate supper together. And I invited all my tax collector friends and all those who were considered sinners by the Jews. And the weirdest thing, Jesus enjoyed being around us, and we enjoyed being around him. We were comfortable with Jesus. It was weird. I mean, here's this holy righteous man and he enjoyed the company of sinners and tax collectors you know you might think of of uh, how you might have responded i mean are you comfortable with people like that but he was now i knew that he didn't approve of our sin because later the pharisees came up and they asked his disciples who all by the way weren't all in there sitting with us some of them were standing outdoors i guess they just couldn't stomach being in there with us but some of the pharisees asked the disciples why is he sitting in there eating dinner with them 
And Jesus heard him. And he said, you know, I didn't come to heal the healthy. I came to heal the sick. See, I know that, you know, he knew we were wrong. But he loved us and opened that relationship so that we might change. You know, if he hadn't asked me to follow him, I would have followed tax collectors and sinners for the rest of my life. And those would have been my only friends, and I would have never, ever changed. Because all my friends would have been just like me. But he chose to love me. He chose to love that sinful person that you'd really rather just be somewhere else. You'd rather avoid them. But he chose to love me. He invested in me. Now, I didn't change overnight. I mean, there were times where I kind of tried to jip the other disciples. I mean, you know, my life didn't change overnight. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I did. And, and, And they weren't happy with me, but, you know, a lot of times he used that as a teaching moment. And he kept loving me. And it took years for me to change to the point that one day I wrote a book of the Bible. Yeah, I wrote a book of the Bible. And it's because he chose to love me. And about that time, Peter, Peter down here on the end, he raises his hand and says, well, I, I've got one more thing I think I, I, I can add to this. Now, this is, this is hard for me to say because I'm embarrassed. Now, I, just before you judge me, realize I've grown over the years, you know, and I'm not the same person that did this, okay? But there was a time near the end of Christ's ministry, and, and he led us all to Gethsemane. And... And we could tell something was really wrong. I mean, he had already told us kind of as we were coming into Jerusalem, he he had told us that we were on our way and he stopped us and he said, now we're going to Jerusalem and they're going to hand me over to the Gentiles and they're going to spit on me and mock me and beat me and flog me. And if you don't know what flogging, you probably guys probably don't flog today, but they would take a whip. With, with leather strands and it had bone and different things and they would whip you and then they'd pull it back like this and that would just rip the flesh from your back. And, and he said, then they're going to kill me. Now, you know, we didn't understand exactly what that meant, but, but we knew something was getting ready to happen. And, and when we came to Gethsemane, he told the, all of us to kind of sit here, but then he told me and James and John to, to come a little further with him. And we, we went further with him. And he began to uh, just to share with, he was so troubled and just so sorrowful inside. Uh, he said, even to the point, he said, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. I mean, he was just beside him. But we had never seen him like this before. I mean, he was Jesus. He was always the leader, and it's almost like now he was leaning on us. And he said, Peter, James, and John, stay here and watch with me and pray. And then he went further, and he fell on the ground and began praying. And we could hear him. He was just wrenching with prayer. Go, God. And I remember him saying something like, You know, if there's any way you can take this cup from me, please take it. But if not, not my will, but your will. And and he was praying, and and, and he wanted us to pray with him. But I I have to say, I was tired. I was really tired. I mean, we had been driving and walking and going and just pushing and and, and trying to get to Jerusalem. He wanted to get there before the Passover for, I'm not really sure why exactly, but, and we've just been walking and walking and walking, and I was so tired. So I, I decided just to sit. And I sat down. I thought, well, I can pray sitting. And my eyes just were so tired. And, you know, I knew he was, 
I mean, he was praying. He was, he was just hurt. You could just hear it. But I was so tired. I thought, well, I can, well, I can pray laying back. And I laid back. And the next thing I know, an hour had passed, and, and Jesus came up to me, Peter. I mean, it's almost like he was blaming me. He said, Peter, men, are you asleep instead of praying? He said, wake up. Stay watch with me. And, and I was ashamed. I can't believe that I fell asleep. And he went back and prayed again. And, and, and you know, as he was there, we could almost see it looked like sweat, drops of sweat that looked like blood. It, it was like so intense. It's almost like he was had blood dripping from his head. And he went back and he prayed some more. And I knew that I should have stood up and just prayed walking. But I was so tired. You know, I, I had a hard day. It was tough. So I sat and leaned up against the rock. And the next thing I knew, he was waking me up a second time. And then it was a third time. And the third time he said, guys, the hour's at hand. Here comes my betrayer. And at that point, a series of events took place. He was taken, just like he said, he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was beaten, he was flogged, and he was crucified. And there was never a chance when I could make it right. And I felt so guilty. I felt so bad because he was dead. And that was my last experience with him. Just completely leaving him in his most difficult trimo actually the only point in life where he ever leaned on me and I failed him. I failed him. The only point when he ever truly needed me and I was just too tired. Now, you know, we can probably all kind of imagine what he might have felt. I mean, have you ever lost a, a husband or a wife or a child and you called the church and maybe the pastor never called back? Or maybe he showed up three days later. And you think, how can you do that? Do you not know what I'm going through here? Or maybe you lost a job or your wife left you or your husband left you and you call your best friend and they say, well, we're going shopping. But when I get back, I'll come by. And you're like, what? Shopping? Are you serious? Did you not hear what I just said? I mean, have you ever had someone really close to you or someone who's significant in your life and you're going through something and they just drop the ball because they have some petty thing like they're tired? How do you respond to that? Was that the last time they were your best friend? You know? Was that the last time you went to that church? Well, I had to deal with this for a while because, you know, in my mind, Jesus was dead. I, I, I didn't understand exactly how things were going to unfold. And well, three days went by, and all of a sudden, some of the women who had been following Jesus, they came in. They said, "He's alive," and we're like, "What? He's alive?" And James, I mean, John and I look at each other. Of course, you know, John was there too. He, he was a part of this. We look at each other and we say, is it possible? And so John and I, we run to the grave and sure enough, it is empty. But then, instead of it made me feeling, I mean, on the one hand, I was kind of happy. But on the other hand, I felt guilt. I felt horrible for what I had done. I felt terrible. What am I going to say to him? What is he going to say to me? I mean, the only time he needed me, and I just slept. Well, the time came. We were eating dinner one time, and I'll never forget it. You know, I'm kind of looking down the whole time, and we're eating, and everybody's kind of all joyous, and, and I'm just feeling guilty as I can feel. And I'm looking down, and Jesus looked at me. He said, Simon, son of John, and I looked up. He said, do you truly love me more than all these? I felt so bad. I knew what he was asking. I said, Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. And I looked down again. 
And then I heard, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than all of these? It bit, it, it hurt. I looked up and said, Jesus, you know that I love you. And I looked down, you know, and I felt bad. I felt horrible. And the third time he asked me, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And I felt like he was rubbing it in my face. I felt like he was, he was you know, shaming me. And I said, Jesus, you know all things. You saw Nathaniel before he was there. You saw him under the tree. You, you know everything. You saw your death coming. You know that I love you. And each time I said that, he said, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me. He was saying that. Not to rub it in my face, but he was saying, Peter, I want you to continue to feed and minister to the church, to my sheep, to my lambs. He was accepting me. He was allowing me three times, for the three times that I fell asleep and for the three times that I denied him and when, when I was around the guards. And even a, a, a middle school girl, I denied that I knew Jesus a little bit later on. Each of those times, I think he was saying, you love me, you love me, you love me. Now feed my sheep. And he accepted me. He allowed my sinfulness, or he didn't let my sinfulness put a barrier between me and him. And because of that, I committed the rest of my life to him. And I, too, wrote two books of the Bible. Because Jesus continued to love me. He chose to love me, even though I let him down at the hour that he needed me the most. So I guess I would challenge you. That's how Jesus loved us as disciples. And I think he's saying the same thing to all people of all ages. To love other people as he loved us. So as you think back over your life and as you go forward, who are the people who have wronged you? Who are the people at work, family members, in-law members, uh, neighbors, who gossip about you, say negative things about you, maybe in your small group, that annoying, self-centered person. You know, the person you say, they are so self-centered. They are so selfish. And so therefore you want to avoid. Who are those people in your life? Because God wants you to stay connected to them. If you don't, if mature Christians don't stay connected to them, then they're left with their other self-centered, selfish friends, and they will never grow. That's how we grow as individuals, is we love as Christ loved. We continue to invest in people's lives, and we continue to allow God to use us in those mean, nasty, ugly people's lives. So I challenge you right now, To think of two or three people, and and I challenge you later to write it down, but in your mind, write down, who are the two or three people? You probably have thought of them many times already as we've talked. Who are the two or three people who God has identified in your life that you've kind of pushed away and said, I don't want to be around them. They are such a pain in the rear. Right? They are. They really are. Who are those people? And you're going to say, but I am going to be a friend to them. I'm going to love them as Christ loved me and begin to invest in their life. Let me pray. Father, we do just thank you for the example that Christ gave us. And we thank you for the way that he demonstrated love for us. Even though we were insulting and selfish and self-centered and stealing and on and on it goes, the things that we did is just unbelievable. But you continue to love us in in order that we might mature and one day be different people altogether. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to identify in our own lives the people like that, the people that we need to love and choose to love so that they can become more and more like you, so that we can help them to grow and to mature. So, Father, we just pray that your spirit would identify those people and give us the strength and the power and the creativity to love them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.